uh, live on tape from room 348 of the Ramada Inn in uh, Kelowna, British Columbia. This is sort of Pucks on Net, a Vancouver Hockey Podcast that doesn't talk about fantasy or fancy stats. This is the second installment of the uh, Pucks on Net road show we've done when the WHL playoffs encompasses our lives. So we've, uh, I have myself, uh, Ryan, the glue chap, although I, there's nobody else I'm the glue of uh, this week, but I've enlisted the Black Aces. Uh, the uh, the Pucks on Net Black Ace is famously making returning to the podcast, Mr. Simon Baldwin. Hello. Hey, how's it going? Uh, so our most handsome of Black Aces and arguably second most uh, attractive member of the Pucks on Net bench next to Gita, uh, handsome Stu Walters. Stu, thanks for joining us. Thank you very much, Ryan, I think. Nice loft room you have here. It's uh, it's quite uh, lovely. And uh, Mr. Grant Wilkins, you're joining us again on the, on the podcast. Your, uh, your second appearance on a PON road show. Actually, it's my third, so I appreciate the uh, <laughs> the recognition that you've given me. So, thank you. Yeah. So, uh, this is kind of like I mean, it's it's re- it's re- it's uh, released by Pucks on. It's kind of like Guns and Roses with just Axel Slash isn't here. Is he's not here? Uh, Duff McKagan is kind of here. It's it's under the Pucks on that umbrella, but it's not that way to sell it. All right. Yes. It's Vince Neil doing a country or county fair. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to jam it out, play a couple more songs that I like, <laughs> skip every third note. I don't know if you've uh, heard... Uh, Put it on cruise control. <laughs> yeah. I have. Nice pun. Thanks. Vince Neil, cruise mm. control. Mm-hmm. On that horrible note, thank, uh, thanks for joining us wherever you got us from. Make sure you uh, follow us on Twitter at PucksOnNetCA or PucksNetCa. Go. Oh. Thank you. And uh, if you want to support the show, make sure you uh, head on over to our Patreon page at patreon.com slash PucksOnNet. Uh, me and PMAC released three, we recorded three Patreon episodes last, uh, last week, uh, our Q and a, which was a lot of fun. Uh, if you want to hear an embarrassing childhood tales of us, including me pretending to know how to skateboard in grade three to an Alanis Morissette soundtrack at the talent show audition, it's worth the $5 a month alone. Pretending to skateboard? Did uh, you know how? Uh, no, I, uh, my neighbor got a skateboard and he gave me his old one, the old banana board. And I thought that I knew how to skateboard when I would stand on the back wheels and turn it to the left and to the right. I thought that was a skateboard trick. And I thought that um, if I just sort of kicked the board out behind me, that that too was a skateboard trick. And so when we were old enough to audition in the talent show in grade three, I figured I would show off these moves and then make my way to the big talent show and win over the school as the coolest guy at, you know, at Sam Livingston Elementary. It didn't happen. Points for trying, though. Yeah. So if you want to hear the whole story of that or me and some uh, me and PMAC talking some embarrassing tales, just uh, head on over to patreon.com slash pucks on net. Okay, Stewie. <laughs> Brock Besser is a uh, Vancouver Canuck. It was probably the most exciting thing that's happened in, I don't know, since Henrik Sedin scored his thousandth point. Um, the This is one of the bigger fears for Canuck fans because it's a common trend with NCAA players. When they, instead of having a three year, is it, Stu, is, or uh, Grant, is it three year? How long does, uh, when you get drafted, do you have to sign with a team? Like uh, if you're drafted out of a uh, Canadian Hockey League? Uh, you have three, three years. You have to sign by your 20 year old season. And NCAA, it's only two years. No, NCAA, it's, I believe you have until, uh, bef- there's, a, there's a time frame before the draft, um, after your senior season. Yeah. So that, that's why you see a lot of the, the trend now. A lot of these teams uh, like to go with the college player uh, draft pick because they control them for longer. They can send them to, to college for four years and have them develop um, for a longer time before they have to make a commitment to them. So then what was the situation with Jimmy VC? Well, he let it ex- – he just didn't sign and then got himself – he didn't. He didn't have to. He didn't go. Re, he just became a free agent. He didn't go back into the draft. I don't believe Grant. I think he was just able to sign. He was originally Nashville, was it? And then he yeah. just went and signed with New York because he. So he let it kind of expire, I guess, on purpose. Yeah, it was like um, like Nick Schultz. Uh, remember yeah. we the Canucks were involved in those sweepstakes. Wasn't it Justin Schultz? Justin, Justin Schultz. Schultz yeah. My 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 bad. Um, but yeah, it, it was the same sort of thing where he. He spurned Anaheim, mm-hmm. um, didn't want to play there for whatever reason, and uh, you won't know, started a bidding war for his services, which is under the CBA. It's it's the player's right. 
Now, with what's with the current condition, the current situation of the Canucks, the average fan's fear was that Brock Besser, an American kid, would kind of want maybe want to follow suit with as Jimmy VC and go to an American club. And the biggest fear was that he wouldn't sign with the Canucks, mm-hmm. and that thankfully was taken care of. You know, early Saturday morning, and he was in the lineup under twelve hours later. And it's it's one of the feel good stories of the year. Yeah, and I think Canuck fans have been extra sensitive with that, guys, especially with the VC, what happened there. So over the last couple seasons now, they've been ex- extra like, oh, what if he doesn't want to? And then you kind of tie in the, the Minnesota uh, tie in, obviously, oh, yeah. being, being from that area, et cetera. So, and because they have a National Hawk League team. But this is interesting how it played out because, you, you know, you're thinking that, may, oh, the agent has some leverage here saying, we won't get him to sign unless you get him up in the NHL to burn the first year of that three-year entry-level contract. But apparently the Canucks were the ones that were very bullish on making this happen. Jim Benning admitting this the other day saying, yeah, no, we want him up here. And I don't really mind the reasoning. And obviously it's not our money, right guys? But, but he (laughs) said, like, get him in for the final nine games, what have you. And he gets acclimatized to sort of what the NHL is all about before you know, some things are expected of him next year. He's expected to be in this Canucks lineup. So it was the Canucks kind of pushing this rather than his agent making a ploy or a play, you know, saying he doesn't want to go to Utica, get him up to NH. You know, obviously it's, it works out for, for them because he burns the first year early and he'll get more money earlier in his career. Is that why an agent would want that first year burnt off right away? A lot of them can use that, yeah. Because, I, because he's, he's, he becomes a better player quicker? But to be clear, though, I, I'm not sure how much the agent plays a role in the in the Besser situation compared to the 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 is it VC or Vesey? VC the VC situation <laughs> because under NCAA rules, um, Besser would have only been able to have an uh, agent for 12 hours. You know, if you have an agent, you can't you can't participate in NCAA. So he also he also he's an advisor. He also was not given that Trans Am or Corvette from North Dakota. That was just given to him. That's a, it's a gift. That wasn't that wasn't you know bought to play there. The yeah. IROC. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know what? I I think this is a, a, a it's a lot to do about nothing. I I look at it's typical Canuck fan paranoia. What can go wrong um, is going to go wrong. Like Besser, from all you know, from all accounts, he's a solid kid. Um, he was going to come here. Uh, anyways, and let's not forget the 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 uh, Troy Stetcher factor here. That's he had funny. he had a he had a friend on the team. He had inside information about the organization. You know, why wouldn't he want to come to Vancouver now with the opportunity that is ahead of him to opportunity to grow with a young core? But isn't there always that go forward? Isn't there always that big fear with American players? Why would you want to play? In the in the Canadian fishbowl in the market and and for the taxes you pay, pay when you could easily just sign with a Florida team or sign with your hometown team like that was the biggest fear with Johnny Goudreau last year. It, it it was, but you know what? The money's not the same everywhere. You know, um, right now these guys are entry level players. If it's all about money. And you can get your what is it, seven hundred or eight hundred thousand dollars? I think nine twenty is. Yeah, the he maxes yeah. out. He'll max if he's at nine twenty, if it's all about money, then you want to sign in Winnipeg, <laughs> or you yeah. want to sign in Carolina, where the cost of living is so much lower, and that money is going to um, extend uh, f- further. I think for a lot of these guys, especially coming out of college, there a lot of them are late bloomers. Um, these guys, I don't care what it says on their birth certificate for a lot of them. They just want to play in the NHL. They don't care where they're playing at the NHL when they start. Now, having said that once their first three years are up or once they come, they become unrestricted free agents, then they want to go on. But at the time, like, you know what? Everybody thinks, okay, you know what? I just got drafted by the Toronto Maple Leafs or signed in Montreal or whatever. The media attention, I know they make a lot about, up, out of, uh, about it, but it's not going to be that bad. You don't really know what you're getting into until you get into it. Yeah, so These guys are smart enough to take the long view, I think. It's not about the first three years at 900K or whatever. It's about the bridge and then the long-term contract after that. You're not working your entire life to make three years of 900K a year, which to me sounds like a hell of a lot of money. But if you're looking at making $70 million down the road for the next 10 years, it's well worth 
taking that uh, that break on the front end. Well, and now and now the Besser expectations are sky high as he gets in his first game. Now he's expected to play top six. He got the game winning goal, and tonight he uh, against Minnesota. He's playing. He's playing the same role. He's playing on the second line with with uh, Bergey and with Horvat. And I. And not you know not that we know anything, but based on the way Willie liked to deploy and set up his rosters, do you think that maybe the fact that he this kid with no NHL experience, and when 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 Willie was always hesitant, you know, with Reed Bushy, I don't know what I have with him. Do you think that maybe there was some a message from above saying you're playing this kid with the Sedin or with with Sven and with Bo? Do you think that maybe that was a, a message from above? Well, you know, that's been the edict for the last two weeks or so, obviously, from Jim Benning saying, play the, the kids and, and who are the kids, you know, anyone under 25, because there's, that's as the whole we've been team talked about, we yeah. talked about, there's not, there's not 18 and 19 year olds trying to push through right now, right? There, then there is a lot of kids on this team anyway, if you're looking at a Horvats and Stetchers and even Triumphkin, 22 years old, right? But uh, with Besser, I think that's an obvious play to... You know, not that Willie's on social media or anything like that, but I, it's, that would be fun, though. But yeah, but put him, you know, put him in a position to succeed here, and you know that was probably pretty obvious to do uh, yesterday, and then tonight, uh, you know, he almost got a goal again. Mark Shifley making a pretty great defensive play to to deny him a goal in the low slot there. So uh, yeah, put him in a position to succeed. I think that's uh, that's fairly obvious for. For Willie D, and I know he's kind of bending the rules because with other players like Nikolai Goldobin, like I, I'm not going to put him on the power play because he hasn't had time to practice. Well, that's funny, right? Besser hasn't practiced at all, and he <laughs> yeah. kind of slides right in, right? And or Boucher, he gets you know, the, practicing, it's a big right? difference but, between a Reed Boucher yeah. that you picked up off waivers, and you're like, ah, let's see what works out, and a guy yeah. you put up was he 23rd overall first yeah. round, like a kid that you've been developing for a long time. There's probably more rope there. I think also when you get a guy coming from a college uh, program, they're a little bit more polished than, say, junior guys and guys, in, in quite frankly, from the American Hockey League. And that's because it's it's a weekend league. They spend Monday through Thursday practicing, going through video, and working on the finer points. And, and, and the, the college game is a very defensive game. So uh, as, a, as a prospect, he's probably more ready – to step in than other guys but yeah i agree it's it's but, but you know what also for now like the pressure's off for for willie and the team like there's no expectations they can't make the playoffs the unrealistic direction that they sent or they they charted at the beginning of the season saying that we're a team that we think that we can make the playoffs that set them back and you know they should have been doing this 30 games ago mm-hmm. should have been doing this two seasons ago almost well. <laughs> it just had right. such a calgary kind of feel at the end of like the aginla era in calgary where they're standing up there and you're like do you really believe what you're saying right now like you're aware of the rest of the league around you next thing you know there's a deadline trade for ole yokanen or some sort of form of colorado oh great line. we got eric weinrich well, at the trade didn't, deadline you fantastic didn't, you didn't need ole yokanen in because you got um erickson in free agency oh yeah yeah he was what, what's his injury do you know right now lower body it, like it's shot, probably the left knee tired of playing like tired of live, playing for uh, willie this year so they just shut him down <laughs> yeah, yeah he's got verbata itis that's right he took the knee on knee in anaheim like oh. two and a half weeks ago or whatever it was oh, right that's not that's not a, that's not a funny joke to make but well he, whatever i mean just shut him like why why rush him back though i don't but, why, why bother exactly but watching the minnesota game last night and i think why the canucks in my mind are so willing to burn and a year of his of his entry level deal is you know what as someone who's not really a huge canucks fan i got some hope you know i looked at that oh you know what besser berchi uh Bo together yeah. and i think you know what that is the semblance of a first line we're stuck with the sedines and who are and erickson for another year Maybe they can be more effective with limited minutes and I think not playing first-line roles and not getting first-line matchups. Got to correct you there. I think Michael Chaput has uh, taken the, the second-line spot from uh, Louis Erickson. Well-earned, sir. Line sir well-earned. Or, or second-line if you're talking Sedins now. Yeah, That's but, a top-line guy right no, there. But Grant is right. It, it is. They're selling, they're selling hope, and that's why I think that uh, Benning, et cetera, maybe management or you know ownership was so bullish on getting him in right away because some people were a little bit like surprised, honestly, that – like shove him in right away get him in here because it is a play you know it makes more economic sense and again it's not our money right but like to you know why not 
why force them in when you can get those three years at a cheaper rate? Uh, you know, it's it, I know it's, it's almost a, good, a million yeah. dollars. It's whatever. a goodwill move by but the Canucks. See, yeah. It makes sense. I mean, bringing his parents into the dressing room, doing the starting yeah. lineup. It's clear that they're trying to be like, hey, you're part of the future. We want you to be here. Yeah, but you know what? You know how many tickets they've already sold over this weekend, guys? Just for the rest of remainder of the yeah. season they, for for interest, and then you know you have packages for next year, season ticket renewals. You All that them. is very important going forward for next year. Yeah, and it's I mean like. And look at me, like Saturday morning, that was against Minnesota. If, if on a, a, a Saturday 11 a.m. game when you're eliminated from the playoffs, that, nobody gives a shit. That was yep. appointment viewing. You're excited about the game. You're excited about the product, and you're excited about this all kid line of players that are supp- are going to be with the team for the long run. There's no mix and match of maybe in a couple of years they'll take. You know, you you'd see Bo and and you'd see Horvat and, and Berchi with like Reed Boucher or somebody, or mm-hmm. maybe. But you're like, maybe in a couple of years, they'll find a guy to play. Like, this is the line. Yeah. And you could see this line being a top line for years to come, and it's great to see Well, it. everyone's calling them. They all, you know, the Bs. Everyone wants to triple say B. killer Bs, triple Bs. I just get rid of that. It, why don't you just call them the succession plan? Yeah, it's good. Right? It's finally there is something there for the Sedins to fall back on to be, as you guys say, the second line. And we've Grant mentioned it. Like, we've seen that even a lot over the last week and a half where where. Horvat and Berchi, et cetera, were getting more minutes than actual Daniel and Henrik. Yeah. And you saw the other night in Chicago where Daniel and Henrik had, they had good nights. Plus, you know, and, and maybe they're not seeing um, Seabrook and Keith and, and like the top pairing for <laughs> once. And they're saying, hallelujah, how, what took so long? We're 37 years old. Yeah. Somebody <laughs> please help us. Please. I've been carrying this water for so long. Right. Uh, so actually, we should probably get into a read here. Guys, I just got it. I just got it. Got to pay some bills here. Got something I got to say here. You know, we're you know we're a bunch of guys. We're red blooded Canadian males. You know, we're talking about hockey. We're talking about beers. And you know, sometimes we're talking about you know eyeglasses. And you know, I'm 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 saying to myself, with all the options out there, why is it that m- uh, so many people, including local sports pros, trust their eyes to image optometry? You guys got any idea why? Any clue? It must be the best. Is it brick? The, is it the brick and mortar service? Oh, you're, uh-huh. you're goddamn right, Baldwin. <laughs> it could be the online prices with that brick and mortar service, and it could be the direct billing. You know what direct billing is? We didn't know for weeks. Until Healthcare just takes care of it. It's just magic. You know, you just walk is? in, they give you glasses, and you leave. No fuss, Beautiful. no muss. Yeah, it's like. A <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> or it could be that they're the only ones to offer a doctor's eye exam in a complete pair of glasses for just eighty nine ninety five. Those guys online, they're just selling you one lens at a time. It's crap. Like I said <laughs> like I said last week, clearly contacts more like clearly bullshit. An unbeatable deal that'll ensure you catch your next match in glorious HD. I mean, what else could you expect from the most affordable eye chain in BC? Exclamation mark, question mark. That means that that is an exciting statement when there's an exclamation mark and question mark. Mm. Or, or an exciting question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> an exciting question? Yeah, yeah. A question? Image optometry, the official eye doctors of the Canucks and Pucks on Net. Online at image.ca or image.com. Imagine more for less. I need to record that call so I don't have to do it all the time. Yeah. Just a little button hit. You need a sound bite. Um, well, okay, so we're talking about the future. We're going, we'll, 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 we'll pad this mother with a, a lot of Canucks off the top. Um, Besser's here. The future is ish now. Um, is, do we have any any idea who the coach of the Vancouver Canucks is going to be come training camp in, in this uh, September? Oh. I mean, you could. I don't know if the odds-on favorite would be would be a Travis Green right now. I mean, you, it's it's you're opening up a huge can of worms here now. How about this, guys? <laughs> how about this? Forget Travis Green, Dallas Eakins, no. two point Eakins. Fruit in the press room. Come on, that's gonna be that's gonna go over quite well. I forgot about that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. I don't think I. You know, and I'm sitting here. Does you can you're not, not you haven't asked that question, but Willie Desjardins does he deserve to be punted? Right? Because I do think, if I'm not mistaken, I thought Absolutely he signed not. a four. I thought he signed a four. So this is year. Is it year three now? I'm now I'm getting all confused. How long was he's been here? But maybe deal. maybe it was he had leverage though because Pittsburgh was interested. So I, that's what I thought he was able to get a, a four. But maybe maybe it is three. As soon as as soon as we, uh, you find out Pittsburgh is interested in, be like, wow, geez, well, maybe we can get him. Yeah, well, exactly. If, if Sid doesn't hate him, well, yeah. Jesus, let's pick him up for twice the price. Yeah. So I know I don't know if there's market fatigue with Willie and stuff like that. I I do I do feel like it's kind of been a little bit unfair. I do know the optics behind the bench. Like I know some people don't love the way like. 
like maybe he looks or, or and there there has been certainly there's been issues with uh, player deployment out there. Obviously, you know at end of games and why isn't Horvat out there? Why you know there's you know a couple of years ago against Calgary with the you know totally out coached, right? Uh, who's the your players out. Michael Furland? Your coach no, who's the French Canadian Bob, coach? Bob, Bob Hartley. Hartley. Bob Hartley. Yeah, and look where him. Bob Hartley is now. No, that's too, true. So it's that's like, true. Ooh. But in the series, Next coach of the Canucks. in the series, he, oh please. You know, but but you know he 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 did win that series for sure in terms of game planning, etc., and in game decisions. But overall, guys, I think Willie Desjardins has done a good job. He's helped some youth um, come along here. Horvat, the first year, he 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 admitted in training camp, I'm not thrilled to have this guy like even as part of my roster and he, you know, and he gave him chances and he gave him chances and Horvat flourished, you know, Troy Stetcher, you, you, you know, mm -hmm. Tr Trampkin has evolved pretty well. And look at the man games lost this year. Canucks lead the league by a, a long, long margin and the effort level on a nightly basis this year th has been very good. Now at the end of the day, do they, do they need to change? I don't think that he's like lost the room or any of those cliches, but he's he's had the the most injury riddled team in the league. Look at the crazy surgeries: Good Branson, Dorsett, oh yeah, Rodine. I mean, there's just been. Th it's a hospital. They have there's a wing a at VGA. Ton going Canucks. on, but you know Can't what? He's clearly center. he's. You can tell that he's a bit exasperated, and you know maybe they all sit down and and. He, he wants to move on even himself. And trust me, it won't take long for his phone to ring. He's, yeah. he's very I don't think that uh, whoever is coaching the next two, three seasons is not going to be the guy who's going to enjoy the success of his efforts over the next two, three seasons. I think you bring in a guy who's a development guy, Rich. maybe it's Travis Green, and then you bring in a winning coach after that. And you go and look at somebody else. The, th the thing is, is you have a development guy already in place. Yeah, so maybe he just the, stays. The, the guy is a phenomenal teacher. I think what you've had unfortunately for Willie, is unclear, uh, unreasonable expectations from management mm -hmm. and a direction that has been kind of all over the place. I think what you need to do now is you, you talk to your guys in, in the room, especially the young guys. You know, you talk to Bo, you talk to... Um, you talk to Stetcher, you talk to Hutton, you talk to all these guys that have been, where Willie has been instrumental in their careers as, as far as being their first NHL coaches. What is he teaching them? What is, what... Um, How to earn a spot. Well, exactly, because you know what? There's, going, there's a lot of young players on the roster. They need to get more young players on the roster. They need... Uh, you know, eventually, hopefully, Vertanen makes his way back in here. Yo Levy's going to uh, come back in here. You need a coach that can teach those guys how to play the right way. Travis Green, I love Travis Green. You know, we dealt with him down mm -hmm. in Portland, and he's a wonderful guy. I don't think that that's the situation that you want to bring him into. Um, I look at Willie as I look at Ralph Kruger when he was in Edmonton. Mm -hmm. Ralph Kruger was teaching those guys to play the right way, and he got the, par he got the rug pulled out from underneath him. And maybe the Oilers are in the playoffs two years ago rather than when was this he the, year. When was he the coach of the Oilers? Before, before Dallas Aikens. It was when Aikens. they had that little spike. They were terrible, and they had a little spike. Oh, they didn't yeah. make the playoffs. So they were a little bit in, better, and then They brought him in for a year, and they were in a playoff spot come the All-Star break. Yeah. And then they went into the tank after the All-Star break. And that's when I think Tambellini got forced out and they brought in Mac T to make bold moves. <laughs> and that's when they got rid of him. Yeah, well, he got a raw deal. Grant's right. I, I, Kruger. Yeah. 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 But now that, you know, the, the Burroughs trade and the Hanson trade has said, okay, you know what? We, have a, we now have a direction where we are bringing in young players. You got the coach there that's already there to, to work with young players. So I know the Vancouver market is clamoring to bring Mark Crawford back. <laughs> and I don't understand that. Which I don't all. understand. And, and Crow may have changed his stripes over in, over in Switzerland, but he may be the right guy to bring in two years from now. Yeah. And they're cresting. Once Willie He's the winning has got guy. these guys ready. Because you remember with when Crow came in here, he had. He had he, he there was a series of coaches that kind of brought that the guys up to this step, and then Crow came in and put them up to the, the next to level. the next level. Well, they're yeah. not. I mean, the, yeah, like you're saying, they're a few years away. They could challenge for a wild card spot next year based on what they have. But I mean, is 
is Willie going to be the coach that is that next step? Could he take that crow leap the way, you know, or, or they do they need to let him go in two years with an actual, like now it's kind of discrediting Willie. No, I think in my opinion, it's right now your number one, your number one priority has to be developing these players into NHL players. Yeah. You got, you have a, 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 a fantastic talent in gold Dolben, mm-hmm. but Who's going to teach him to be a complete player? Oh, Mark Crawford, obviously. He's well, going to yell at him. He's yeah. going to he's yeah. going to tear a strip off him. He's, he's softer he's... crow now, but no, Grant's right. Like Willie, Willie is he, a great he teacher, and he's not text. a yeah, he's not a pushover <laughs> either, right? And yeah. and that's what and that's what's that's what's so funny on on Twitter when you know someone gets sat down. Like Boucher in Chicago last week got sat down for the final ten minutes or so of the third period because he made a you know pretty horrendous defensive mistake on a on the four three goal. Richard Panic, you know, and and just kind of a lazy move but you know and somebody well is it teaching him by sitting him down well he's going to remember to kind of move his feet and be a bit more determined defensively next time or else he knows he's going to be picking splinters out of his butt right like you know so as grant says like teaching them to be complete players i think the guy is in place Mm -hmm. and and it's and it's kind of easy where if they really hit the the skids next year by january i guess you to appease the fan base that's when you can maybe make your move, but I don't agree. I still don't really agree with it. But it's just it's almost like the get out of jail free card. Like they'll probably they'll struggle next year. I mean, I think that's going to be terrible next yeah, year. Yeah. I say you you're saying like optimistic. I think it, for them to be challenging for a wild card spot next year. But anyway, why not bring him back? Because I, I don't know. Look. if Travis Green wants to walk into this like as it is currently constructed right now for for to start his NHL. You know, he, you've got to look after your own. Um, resume and your own kind of, yeah. you know Especially what I mean? your like, first one. Yeah, like, so he doesn't want, he, you know, he's seen what happened to Dallas Eakins and all that. Like, you don't want to fall flat right away. And, yeah. like, so if the Canucks, I mean, and I, these things, I, do you guys think people, and I guess they do, but I always have trouble with, like, the season ticket renewals, they need to see a new coach come in. You know is what that, helps season fans, tickets is winning. Yeah, our winning fans hockey. Really, I, and I know it does exist. Like I know there are fans out there that say, oh, "I'm not going to buy a ticket until Willie's gone." Okay, I guess that's really? your prerogative. Aren't but you a fan that of the team? to me, that's to me, that's ridiculous. Yeah, and, and if it you're, rarely not, you're works not looking out. properly because Willie's yeah. done good things, I I think that though, I think that if you are making the investment in season tickets, um, what I would want as a season ticket holder is some clear direction. Yeah. And I would want my general manager or my president, like just Trevor Linden can do no wrong in this city, is to come out and say, you know what? We were wrong and we need to start. And we're not starting from rock bottom because we've already got some good pieces that are in place here. But this is what we're going to do. Is it going to be easy? Are we going to make the playoffs this year? Probably not. But you're going to see our future stars develop along the way so almost a toronto very honest setting the expectations as low as humanly possible so if you manage to step over that bar everybody's super excited about it right yeah. and they're finally getting there guys like yeah. literally in the last month that's what they finally finally have done mm-hmm. and and think about this within this like spin cycle that's been the last two years of spinning their wheels uh Willie's kind of been caught in the middle because they've been trying to do, they've been trying to go down a couple different pathways at well, the retool, same time. Retooling on the fly. What does that mean exactly? Well, is, no, that a, is that something that's it's, possible? It's failed. Yeah, yeah it has it, failed. I mean, yeah. But, I mean, there might be examples of one or two teams being able to San do Jose. that over the past. Um, that's about it. That's all I can think of. San Jose keeps staying good. Uh, I was talking about, oh, Chicago has kind of been able to kind of re-inject, if you will. Yeah. Like, look at their core. We yeah. all know. You, you can do that with that core. Yeah, but yeah. every every two years, that Chicago Chicago team seems to kind of Stu, you could make it on that team, and I've seen you skate. Okay. You could, thank you. Buddy. You could make it on the play a fourth line special. Yeah, but then, but San Jose, they started bringing in guys like uh, I, I would say, kind of. You got the two guys. You got you got Jumbo, and you've got uh, Marlo. Marlo. But they brought in Pavelski and Couture when yep. those guys weren't thirty six and thirty seven. They brought them in when they were mm-hmm. thirty two and thirty three, and still had three or four, as they're proving now, five or six productive years. <laughs> yeah, You also get super them. lucky with Brent Burns and a change in the way the game is played. You've had a defenseman, was he at 70-odd points? Yeah, that well, was unheard he's been of unbelievable. Five, years but, ago. but to the point, guys, I think the Canucks are finally – uh, admitting and, and realizing what they really actually have to do and it, whether you call it tear it down and start from scratch, it's not totally scratch, but at least now it's bringing in the youth 
and kind of trying to build and you'll see a much even it's it was pretty young this year but oh you, yeah you'll see them all kind of going in the proper direction yeah and it's starting now it's fascinating that it may like the whole problem with the canucks might just be a messaging issue that the message was incorrect in the first place and that it should have been expectations should have been set lower yeah but i mean the message in a, in a locker room every night is win the game true like, you can't i mean the, the the tank the tank mentality and and the rebuild mentality is everywhere but the dressing room. Exactly. Because no matter yeah. how, what, how shitty of a team you put together, there's still a pride of we're going to yeah. win this game. And Willie's wired a certain way too. Obviously, like there's, I mean, he's got yeah. his, he's looking after his own brand. Every you know, it's yeah. it's exactly expected. You're he's trying to win. You don't blame the guy one bit. And yeah. all those players are obviously trying to win too. Half the team that we're you're seeing on a nightly basis right now, there's there's I think there's like six RFAs right. There's guys working for contracts for next year, LeBate, Cramarosa, yeah. Boucher, Shore, the list goes on. They're, they all need jobs next year, so they're they're auditioning. And and the thing is, is, you know, by having a coach like Willie, you know, we're not looking at the Edmonton Oilers here in a 10-year rebuild. Like, they're doing it with a coach uh, and with players where it's like, you know what, I'm teaching them the right way to play. In the in our own end, we might lose every game two one because we can't score any goals. But we're not going to be the Oilers where we're going to lose every game, blown you know, up every six night. five yeah. because we can't keep a puck out of our own our, of our own end. So I, the way hockey is now is you have to take care of that end first and foremost before you can even think about it. And that's like you know there it's no it's it's an old fluke that the Oilers are getting back to the playoffs. And yes, I understand that they get. Connor McDavid, but without Darnell Nurse and Clefbaum and Larson and a solid decor this year, they're not even they're nowhere near the playoffs. Yep, Cam Talbot finally Talbot kind links, of getting that yeah. way. Yeah, but the defense, you're right because mm-hmm. it's, it's not it's, it's not as similar to an AHL defense as it has been for the last ten years. Cynicism aside, like do you do we not get the the feeling that you know Willie is a bit of a stubborn coach? I think he, you have to be though. But like I mean, you're a coach. he's teaching them the good the right the right way to play. The smart way to play a two-way hockey, but you know, and you talk about his deployment, and that's something that's been beaten into the ground. But it just seems like Bo Horvat had to do almost everything outside of score fifty and thirty-eight to to give to get Willie's trust. And like he was a good player, he was playing good minutes, but he was always demoted. He was always taking defensive draws. He was never. It took so long for him to be on the power play with the Sedins or as the extra attacker with the Sedins, and it just feels like he had to do so much. Like Willie wouldn't see Bo Horvat as anything other than uh, a younger Brandon Sutter, yeah, but, but a it, Manny Malhotra. But that's how it. I think that's in my world. Uh, I don't know if that's calling me old school or something. In the, my world, that's okay, man. I, yeah. I think yeah. obviously Henrik and Brandon Sutter. Um, name some other veterans. They deserve and uh, and have earned a longer rope. Uh, I personally don't think he was really put his thumb down on Horvat that much because uh, I thought it was pretty refreshingly honest. Even that, I remember being at the opening day of training camp three years ago, and he was he kind of said like you know he said like I wasn't I've been very impressed by Horvat when they when we had our summer meetings and they told us that you know Horvat we expect Horvat to be on the big club like Willie was even saying like I guys let's hold on a second here I don't I don't know about this but you know so he's. I think I think he's given him some nice some nice uh, opportunities, obviously, and 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 Horvat's done yeah, great. But yeah, is it, is Horvat where he is now without that maturation process? If he's given more responsibility, more ice time right off the hop, is he as good a player as he is now? Yeah, is maybe not. Question. And remember, he had plus minus issues too. Like he's yeah. he's he's he hasn't he wasn't the greatest defensive player. He's a good all-around player. It wasn't the, you know, he's and he's yeah. still learning that. Worked know? on his skating uh, a lot. I oh, think yeah. I think it's brilliant. <laughs> and I think this and, and no one will ever say this, but I think it goes to the genius of Willie because as a coach, you have to find ways to motivate your players. And with a team, there's 23 different personalities in that dressing room and you know, you have to find a way to to motivate these different 23 personalities. You, know, you might have to coddle some guys. You might have to give tough love to some guys. What has Bo always been known for in his career, whether it be in junior or now with the Canucks? Hard worker. So, yeah. what is what has he done? He, you know, by taking minutes away or demoting him to the fourth line or not giving him praise or not giving him, um, you know, too much too soon. Too much too soon. Yeah. 
what has Bo done? He's proved him wrong through hard work and built himself into the an all-star in his second year in the league. Well, shit, we just put a real positive spin on Coach Willie D based on his future. You know, we're talking about his job security. So I'm feeling we're, convinced now, actually. I, I, I wasn't just, so sure before the show, and now I'm convinced. I'm like, Willie D, yeah. How much did he pay you? I just think it's, it's too easy. It's just in there. so easy to poke holes, in, poke holes in him, understanding some of the faults for sure. And you, and you mentioned it, like there's, you know, stubborn and some player deployment. But I think there's been a lot of, I think overall there's been a lot of good as well. And just to kind of kick him to the curb i think it, it's it just seems uh, to me a little uh, i don't know i don't even it's not not premature it's just it just is like let's look at the facts folks let's i think look at the facts and i think that if if they're gonna because you know you know just just from this 15 20 minutes of talking about willie you know i'm starting to warm up to him a bit but like you talk like trevor like linden and the canucks need to spin it away if they're gonna keep willie on and say we're not letting him go he is our coach next season they need to to do a job to explain it and sell it to me and present like, here are the reasons why he's sticking around instead of just saying, yeah, Willie Desjardins is going to remain as head coach because that's not going to, that's not going to appease. That's mm-hmm. just going to piss off fans. Like you yeah. need to, you need to explain that you're making this decision for the right reasons. Here are the smart reasoning behind this. And that's that. Yeah. Like, would you be convinced if, if they did have a year end press conference saying we have really liked how he's worked with some of the younger players and give example a b c d and then if they said look at the patchwork lineup he's had to deal with yeah and look if, at this injury to good branson look at granlin look at uh rodine what you know the list goes on you know what i mean so i'm, I'm wondering what how much it would take to because i i don't even know if i like the word spin but like how much would it take to convince average fan or have they just made up their minds? Well, I think that they've always been the way they dealt with the media and the things they would say, like you know, dating back to from Vertan and stuff, and and how Willie explains his decisions. He needs to come out and saying, if, if you know, if Botch or, or Patterson or somebody comes in and says, "Well, Willie, you know, what about how you're playing Shapu more minutes than Bo on this night?" You know, he's gonna say, "Listen, here's why," and he has to. And he's yeah. like, "You know, I had a, I had a I had a shit lineup. Everybody's hurt. Here's why I did yeah. this." And he needs to just. Be, you know, yeah, to, and he's got to walk that fine line. Yeah, he can't he's, throw people under the bus, but I think you might be getting to another point where maybe he's not the most eloquent guy in the world. Yeah, yeah. but you know what, though? It's been a, and, and that might work to his detriment sometimes. You kind of maybe talk in a circle about talking about a, why a guy didn't play in the final two minutes and stuff, and, and that can be kind of held against him sometimes. And it but makes at him look weird. Yeah, but at the end of the day, uh, just presenting all the facts and, and and what he's had to deal with the roster, even he's been provided patchwork lineup, the injuries. Listen, I mean, there's just lots that going is on. A great American Hockey League roster. There's, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> there's not a coach in the NHL that's not stubborn and would mm. act the same way up there when questioned about his player deployment. Yeah, yeah. Now you brought up a good point about eloquent speakers, and you know, and so that's our my perfect segue. Uh, to the to another team to our nation's capital, the Ottawa Senators, because Eugene Melnick. Now, based on how much his comments are in the media, you'd think that he was a GM, maybe the president, maybe the head coach, maybe a player coach, not just a loudmouth rich owner that really likes to play fanboy and comment on all the things that are going on with his team. Uh, last week, he was on the pod. We were talking about him on the podcast because he was oddly vocal about not wanting to send players to to the olympics and he said oh, i wouldn't send carlson to play for sweden to beat our canadians oh hell no now maybe a canadian and he realized mid-conversation he sounded like a bit of an idiot this week he had to chime in on Sidney crosby and his and his gratuitous violence against mark Mathot when he called um he called Sidney crosby a whiner beyond belief now i just want to get your opinions on if an owner should be critiquing arguably the best player in the world for should we call he should he be able to call him out for that i think eugene melnick needs to leave the running of his team to the people that he hired with the expertise to run his team if you have an issue you're the owner you're more than mm-hmm. able to go and speak with your gm speak with your head coach but i think it's very rare that in a position of power, if you throw it out in the media, anything good comes out of it. Do any do any players call Sidney Crosby a whiner? Oh, Brandon Dubinsky. Or well, besides public en- Sidney's public enemy number one, but like you hear it from you heard it from Torts, you hear it from Mel- yeah. Melnick, and I'm just curious if the players themselves 
will call Crosby a whiner. On the ice, they might say it in a different way. But, but in the whiner. media, yeah. I don't regularly Haters hear Haters going to hate, man. Yeah. yeah. Like, but, I don't regularly hear that from people that are actually playing the no, game. No, it's not good. Like, a player, it, like, think about a player is not going to come out and really and, and say that because nothing good can really result yeah, I mean, in that. You're not you, going to come yeah. out and be like, oh, I mean, sometimes in a heated playoff series or, you know, people might say, hey, Brandon Dubinsky, you you and Crosby seem to go at it. You mm-hmm. know what kind of rivalry do you have? And usually at the end of the day, it's like, oh, he's a good, great player, and you know things get feisty out there and heated. And but this is an owner. This, this is an how, owner. Yeah, how no, is an owner worth one point two billion dollars? Not have the tact that an NHL yeah. player has. Well, he needs. How is that they possible? need to put him down for like you know the twenty four hour rule or whatever. <laughs> yeah, they, they don't comment because he was. I think he was on sports radio the next morning after the Mathot thing with yeah. the, the finger and uh, and clearly you know at the same time I do appreciate the passion and and it's happened to your own player, but. You you have some of the comments over the last two years, what have you, and it's like, what is this the third of well, no, we, event? Or we, there's been lots, but it just kind of comes across as a little bit immature. The Dave Cameron incident was particularly ridiculous when he called out Dave Cameron. What was that? Three quarters of the way through the season, something yeah. like that, for his starting lineup. Yeah, on could, the first day of the season, like, yeah. why are you doing yeah. that? This How is, is sleep, that positive? Like, sleep on it, bud. This is this yeah, is write not, your letter, put it in a drawer, right. think about it for 24 hours, and right. if you still want to send it, then you can. That's send it. it. We did some. We were talking about this. We I did some research. It's like this isn't a. I've had a. I have. I've had an eventful two weeks. This is. This has been going on for the past couple of years. He when when Matt Cook accidentally cut uh, Carlson's. What was that? His Achilles. His Achilles. Yeah, and he he wanted to launch launch a forensic investigation. Are like, you kidding me? Like what do you like? Why is this guy? available for so many so many comments like this is an he old... sold his business recently so uh, i think he's just living in barbados <laughs> and doing cool stuff i come up th- i come at this from a little bit of different angle here because i spent five years in the ottawa market and when he bought the team so i i love what he's doing to be honest, shooting with his you. mouth off. I love him shooting his mouth off because you know what? He came into Ottawa. He's the reason that there's hockey, NHL hockey. Oh still yeah, they in were Ottawa. on the brink. He bought. He them saved the, the franchise. He's going to build a new arena downtown uh, for them. <laughs> Name me one other owner in the National Hockey League that has a presence. Would you not, as a media, like to be able to hear what? We just talked about for 25 minutes on the Canucks and Brock Besser and, and, and Willie. Wouldn't you like to know what Francesco Aquilini... We did know what they wanted. They spent the last two and a half years meddling with the team. But not publicly. Uh, at least at least Melnick is accountable. You want to you wanna quote from the owner? You can phone up the owner and you can get him on the radio show. He's the boss. He sets... He's the heartbeat of the organization. He sets... The entire business plan and how they're going to do things. He's accountable. Does he go too far? Absolutely. Did Sidney Crosby, in the heat of the moment there, intentionally slash Mark Mathot to sever the end Absolutely. of his finger off? Or was he's it an gu- accident? He's a garbage player. Absolutely, it was an accident. I so, thought it was Tom Sacito up there. <laughs> right. But I don't... I. I I have a problem with some of the things that he has said, but I don't have a problem with the transparency. Isn't it a little embarrassing if you're a Sens fan? And then, the, and then, like, what? Like, if if the if the pig and the Penguins come in and, and beat the shit out of the Senators yeah. in the playoffs? But as I said, like where I said, I said that I do appreciate the passion because I, you know, you you try to separate it, and I'm trying to put myself in his shoes, and I and I could see myself, you know, reacting a little bit the same way. Now I, I'm saying it now, like the ultimate way to deal with it is the 24 hour rule, mm-hmm. but, and hopefully I would abide by that. But you know what? He's an eccentric guy and you know, Ottawa, maybe he's also kind of st- sticking up and he's had to stick up for as long as he's owed the team kind of, I I'm sure that they're sticking up for the little guy mentality in a way too, because there's the superstar that uh, maybe gets away with much more than, than uh, anyone else gets away with. And obviously people are buying tickets to see Crosby rather than seeing Mark Mathot play. But is at the end of the day, that that's not what it's all about for... Is there not a reason Melnick. why you don't hear from most of the other owners in the league? Is there not a reason for that? The like, Melnick is the outlier? And you look at, and this is pot calling the kettle black as a Canucks yeah. fan, but I mean, the Sens have had marginal success over the course of his ownership i get the sense that he is a little uh protective of his team like i mean the senators are the forgotten canadian team 
They have the six lowest uh, ticket prices. They're a budget team, and they kind of don't really get the respect. Well, maybe the there's country. a little bit of that. That's what I'm trying to get he's, at. He's there might be a little bit him. more of that angst coming out, and that's where I'm kind of giving him a little bit of rope. I think, a, hey, I still think it's like a little bit immature, and he's got to just sh- shelve it and maybe Take- think about it 48 hours later, and then he probably would be less. But I don't know if he regrets anything, guys. Like, I think you get that rich, so you don't have to regret anything. Right. I think that's the whole point. Yeah, so probably doesn't. Yeah, he definitely doesn't. And I bet you he's not apologetic to what he, to, for what he said. And, and Sid ha- handled it perfectly, I thought. And, and, you know, they'll just... He likes to hear himself talk. Ex- exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Smartest guy and, in the room. And you know what? The, the thing that I respect the most about Melnick is he, he's called his fans out, too. Yeah, you know when he's he's, sales go he's down. gone out and said, you know what? I've spent this amount of money to put this product on the ice, and you people are still not coming. Um, oh man, the you, you know, people from a rich guy. I don't know <laughs> so, if that's going to go over so well. So no, but you know what? It it's it works in Ottawa. The fans love them. The the players love them. It it works, and you know what? It's nice to have you know. It is nice to have an owner of a team engage. I. You know, I take it a step further. I, I'm a I, I'm a Yankees fan, and when <laughs> when George Boo. when George was alive and George was the boss, I loved all that stuff because I knew that whatever he was doing at his core, he was doing what was best for the New York Yankees. And it's the same thing. It's but the you, same thing. But with you could Melnick. spend as much money as you wanted in those days in baseball. You can't do that in. I'm not now. I'm not talking about the money or anything like that. I'm talking about passionate. here's a guy that is is 100% passionate and engaged in his hockey team and trying to make make them the best. And then if you remember before the Aquilinis bought the Canucks, what was the name of the guy that owned it out of Seattle? McCaw. They and he and you would and he was very oh, apathetic, silent. Silent about it, or it yeah. would be the, the the rumors every so often of his desires to move the team to Seattle. And so mm. one phone call. Yeah. Oh, listen, listen, I don't sense. So Grant comes in here. He's paid off by Willie. He, <laughs> he, com- he comes in. We're, we're coming in ready to, t- to dump on him, and we leave here smelling, ro- smelling roses. We come in here to shit all over Eugene Melnick, and we're singing his praises. I, I, just think, I will not I, sing his praises. I just think that, <laughs> I think that every, every sport in North America has a Maverick owner. The yeah. baseball had the Yankees. The NBA has Mark Cuban. The NFL had Jerry had, Jones. Uh, they have Jerry Jones. They had Al Davis. There's nothing wrong with a little bit of color coming out of that out of that level. So then, let me ask you then: if you're if you're liking what he says, see what he says. What is some? What would he have to do to cross the line? What would he have to do? Do you say, well, you know, that's great that he's passionate, but that's a bit too much. If he starts talking about Pizzagate, it's all over. <laughs> <laughs> Well, okay. I'll just say this because, like, I, I again, I still like think it calling, was immature. But yeah. hey, have has have you heard anyone else call Sidney Crosby a whiner? Like, I'm just saying, like, <laughs> I, you have, yeah, we have. So is it's is it the most egregious thing in the world? No, it's probably it's probably not. But in media, like, we like. I mean, we all love sound bites, and that's great. It's, 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 uh, you know, it's acted as a nice topic on on the show tonight, <laughs> right? So yeah. that so that's great. But yeah, like, obviously, you know passionate and maybe a little bit immature at the end of the day but i i just i don't think it's like the worst craziest thing in the world but did, did he not say probably what every ottawa senator fan was thinking after that game as they get ready to hopefully have a long playoff he's not a run, fan and they lose one or two of his uh, he loses one or two of his uh, of his best defensemen you know, Isn't that what got- twitter's for <laughs> I, Conflict's the heart of drama. This is good. Yeah. All right. Let's. Um. Um. I wanted you guys because you follow the dub so much. What's so great about Leon Dreisaitl? Oh, the big smooth. <laughs> is that his nickname? <laughs> well, that's. Is that what we're calling for, him? for me? It is. The yeah. big smooth. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. How, I just. <laughs> That's good. That's yeah, I mean, well, we good. covered him very closely two years ago when uh, he comes he, out of the bench, big smooth. You're looking great out there. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I've ever said that to his face, but I mean, I'm just just w- when he's on the ice, guys, it's like he's got size, speed, poise, vision. Uh, he's been able to translate that over to the NHL level very quickly. Yeah. He's only 21 years old. Uh, was it second season? And second most important player on the Oilers. Like I, I would even put him ahead of Cam Talbot right now. Like oh, yeah. Obviously, it's McDavid. I got Drysaddle. And only because I think that 
you can kind of find goalies Patrick out Maroon there. Patrick Maroon third, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, you know, Cam Talbot, I know he's been very important to the Oilers, but I just, uh, I mean, when we saw him, guys, two years ago, we covered very closely. He, let's say it. I know it's a, it's probably an overused term, but man amongst boys, was well, he not? He was incredible because, like, he was somebody that absolutely took over every game he was playing in. And he went from being on, I think he started in, like, you know, somewhere like in the maybe on the second or the third line and then some point in the playoffs Mm -hmm. they realized that this is the best player on the team and he was the top line guy he was front and center for everything and everything drastically changed the rockets they they cycled him through the i I remember that they cycled him through the first or through the first three lines because they couldn't find anybody who could play with them Mm -hmm. they Mm -hmm. couldn't handle the nhl hard pass and crisp pass and he finally found a connection with Nick Merkley and they took off together and I can't remember who was the third wheel on that line but was that like was Merkley a rookie or like first year in maybe? that was his dra- that was his draft year it was a 17 year old season wow. but I think what what I saw that year and I'd seen a little bit of it before in Prince Albert was he thinks that he's got the physical tools and, but he thinks the game on a different level. And we saw him running the power play off the half wall and the passes that he would see and the guys that he would find. And you know what, you know what he, because he can think that way, he can play with 97. Oh yeah. Yeah. How much of his success currently do you think goes back to be given, being given that opportunity to be the guy, to be, I'm a man among boys. I got swag. This is my thing. I'm going to learn this right now. As opposed to, we were talking about this earlier, a Ryan Nugent Hopkins who was rushed into the league and he ends up getting hurt and he's never really gotten to where people thought he would be. So it, the dry side will take the proper route. I think what what they ended up doing with him is um, they got him. They got him from Prince Albert. They drafted him from Prince Albert, which was a losing culture. They haven't won a championship since they since 1985 when they won the Memorial Cup. They brought him into Edmonton. He Mike made Madano. no. He was, what? He was later. Jeez, what a shit town. Uh, they brought Sorry, <laughs> they brought him in, um, and uh, they brought him into the Oilers culture, which at that point was a losing culture. They sent him to Kelowna, which is which is a, a winning culture, um, and he learned how to win, and he learned how to win a championship as a team, and he brought that he's brought that back to the Oilers. And they've taken off. It's such a valuable experience. I mean, you look at a guy like Taylor Hall, all the talent in the world, but has he learned to be a winner or has he come up through Edmonton's program and he's learned how to lose now? Is he ever going to be able to figure well, that out? But he came from, see, and I was and I was trying to make that connection because um, Nugent Hopkins won one round in the playoffs in the WHL. Eberle didn't, I don't even think, he maybe played a handful of, a, of, a, of playoff games. So that was where I was going with, but but Taylor Hall won back to back Memorial Cups with Windsor. With Windsor, yeah. He knew how to win, but that was a powerhouse team. That was a team that had they they put half their team has, has played uh meaningful NHL games. Adam Henrique, um Oh yeah. Uh the Wellwoods kid brother, um played in the Eric in the Wellwood? League. Yeah, Zach Cassian. Mm-hmm. Um the defenseman uh, down in uh, Anaheim, Cam Fowler, ah, was yeah. on that team. Jeez, uh, Ryan Ellis. Um, <laughs> That's a great team. Was there like that? That he didn't. He was one of the best players, but he didn't have to be the man. When he came to Edmonton, he had to be the man. Well, he was. And he I was the next Sidney Crosby. Well, the prepared. hype was crazy. Yeah. Like the Tyler Sagan, Taylor Hall and, draft, he, or Taylor versus Tyler, who's yeah, better? Blah, yeah. blah, blah, and blah. he was dominant at the OHL level, guys. But you know, you come up and you're you're shoved into the NHL, and let's let's be honest. Obviously, it's a couple steps up. One or two, maybe. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> did did he get away with some bad habits early on, and have they stuck around? Yeah, but. He's he's a you know he's developed even more so into a great player and maybe he's even picked up some better habits just by being in the New New Jersey system. But Grant makes a good point. These these young kids were all forced to kind of learn together, and 
what uh, how much learning was was going on you know and then it starts to become a losing culture and you know there's defensive responsibilities and eh, I, what's I, my motivation and you know the, it's 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 kind of a, a cycle yeah. uh, and yeah. it's, am it's I gonna turning put in, around am i going to put in this extra hour of work am yeah. i going to stay am i going to come early to practice or if i'm just going to you know show up do the, attitude, minutes, the minimal you know? yeah. they, they become the most they, they become the core of the team at age 18 and 19 dangerous and they don't yeah. have they don't have a strong personality to run the team as the captain and the assistant. Like they should have brought in a guy like Lucic. Never mind that you had to overpay him to kind of police the room and show these guys the right way to do it back then. The other problem is is and, and we talked about this with Willie and the danger with with young players is look at how many coaches they cycled through. Yeah. Yeah. It's a it's a you know, I want to say for, for Hall when he came in the league in, in twenty ten he cycled through a coach every year with a different message. Different message, yeah. yeah. And I mean, and one of the older guys that they did bring in was, you know, an Andrew Ferentz, who, like, all due respect, great he, guy, he's like a but fifth, he's a workman. He, and a even at guy. that time, four years ago, was a fifth defenseman. He was, kinda, a, he was a seventh or eighth defenseman. Well, he, he, was, he played when they with brought Boston. In, he paid with, no, but when they brought him in, yeah, well, but on hey, but on the but on Edmonton, he was, you know, he came right in in fifth. But then he started finding himself out of the lineup oh, too, yeah. right? I mean, yeah. so it's. It, I think it, the point about a singular right. voice is really important, which yeah. goes back to our previous conversation about Willie D. But anyways, <laughs> when we were working were for the Vancouver Giants, they had the same issue. They brought in a bunch of different guys young kids you don't have the same expectations you're not teaching them the same way all the time and i think it becomes very confusing and they just start to tune out and coaching turnover and to take it yeah. to a junior level and it's a perfect example because we're here in Kelowna and we're covering the Kamloops Kelowna series the coaches and the players they all rotate out dry was in here for you know a handful of games in a championship run the coaches have moved on there's one single thing or single entity that has, has has been here the whole time and that's Bruce Hamilton who's the owner and the president and general manager he sets the way the culture is and everybody comes in and that's the way you do it and that is the rocket way and he's not calling out people in the media right right yeah. he does that behind the scenes yeah. uh, you talk about you talk to you praise Steinbrenner and he and that's a similar culture here no facial hair goalies have plain masks there is and you know no high jersey numbers. It's, it's, there's a lot of similarities, and it seems to pay off. You know what it does. It, it, the the biggest thing, and but unlike the Yankees under Steinbrenner, that's kind of a you know you you knew who the boss was. But the thing is here, um, it's stability. Um, there's a the way they do things is the way they've done, and and some people might say that it's too rigid. But how do you? argue with the success that they've had they're also teenagers teenage boys who have been told they're the best they're the best they're the best they're the greatest they're the most awesome thing ever for their entire lives and they get to 17 or 18 you need real strong structure to keep those guys all going in the same direction for, for sure but when you talk about the oilers and the halls and the eberleys and the nugent hopkins and the dry sidles up until uh, and 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 hall last year mcdavid you they're teenagers they, oh, yeah, they exactly. need that. It doesn't matter that they're making money. They need, you know, how far ahead would they be if uh, Jonathan Taves was the captain of the Oilers when all those guys came? Yeah. Well, you look at Gabe, oh. Gabe Landeskog, in, Landeskog in Colorado. There's Same thing. Example. Fantastic yeah. leader, but he just wasn't ready yet. And they slapped the C on him, and it's all or gone completely were, sideways. Or if the, they were all able to maybe spend a year and a half in Oklahoma. Yeah, mm -hmm. a little bit less pressure. Right. Mistakes aren't as glaring. Yeah. All those kinds of. I things. think I think the Landeskog the Landeskog example it's a good one, but I think the problem is is they were heading in the right direction under him, and then they brought in a veteran gray beard like Jerome McGinley, and then all of a sudden the locker room splits. Split, yeah. There's a who, division. Who do I look to to take my P's and Q's? Yeah, Grant, you can't trust Jerome McGinley. He's got 15 names. Well, I. Then you also mix in Patrick Waugh's strong personality, a little bit of a volatile kind of guy, and it becomes very, you can see that dividing up into three different camps Absolutely. super quickly. Absolutely. Well, fellas, we got to wrap up this podcast because we've been talking for an hour already. Really? Like, it's, been, it's been flowing. Oh. Um, if, we, if this series goes seven games, we'll be back here. If we're back here on Sunday, Monday, we'll have to do another one of these, a PON road show. We only touched on three uh, three items on the rundown. That's I, when you I, know things are going I well. I desperately wanted to talk about Brad Marchand. <laughs> desperately. I bet you did. What do you want us to talk about? Him? 
I just then it's I I think that he's the uh, he's an MVP candidate and deservedly so. And I know he's hated in Vancouver. I can't but, I can't hate him anymore. But you know what? The season that he's having, um, the guy's a winner. He's won at every level. Um, I, you know, winners have an asshole streak, and that's just the reality with winners. And sometimes it's bigger than others. But there's that part of you that's like, if it comes down to me versus you, he's I a, want it more than you. I'm going to take it from you. He's a he's a cold he's a cold blooded assassin. Yeah, but he's not doing. He hasn't. Well, he's still doing stupid stuff. A I couple mean, things this year with the slew footing, but yeah. I think Simon says a good point. You know, I'm going to take it from you, and and that's that's a good characteristic to have. Like yeah, absolutely. Competitive nature. Do you want to compete level, or do you want somebody that's going to get punched in the face by somebody six times with that compete level? But it's also if you if you <laughs> if you if you look at the structure of their team compared to when he was at his most a holeish in 2011 yeah. the cup till now. There's been the changing of the guard, and he was down here, and he was a bit player and a young guy trying to find his feet, but now the succession plan is in place where you can see the Chara's time has come is coming to an end. They've yeah. already moved out Lucic. Berge, it's becoming Bergeron and Marchand's team. All that, um, all that he's thriving under the pressure because he's a pressure type player. Don't discount the fact that he went over when they missed when they missed the playoffs last year. He went and captained Team Canada at the World Championship, which yeah. they won the gold. And then who was he riding shotgun for in the World Championship or the World Cup? McDavid. No, Sydney. He Sydney. Was, he was on Sydney's That's line. Right. He led the he led the World Cup in goal scoring. It was two points behind Sydney for the points lead in that World Cup, and it just carried over. And the bouquets, yeah. you're right, and the bouquets that Sydney gave him, saying, "This guy, I'm not I'm not dragging him along with me." Yeah, no, yeah. this guy can play. Hard work leads to swagger. Like that hard work, yeah. if you do it consistently over time, you will become better and you will become more confident. And this is his, th- he's got talent. This is his sixth, sixth 20 goal se- season. But when you get into a, when the team becomes yours and you become a leader, you can't be the a hole that you once were. You, to, to make a Canucks comparison, um, when Burroughs got elevated to the first line and started was the, was the wingman with the Sedins and started scoring goals, he couldn't do the stuff that he used to do You're too when valuable. he came in. Yeah. You're yeah. too valuable to the team. You have to contribute in, in other ways. Your role has evolved within the within the team. Yeah, and he's yeah. setting more of an example. Exactly, evolving. And he, you know, I'm not going to do something that's going to Im- embarrass myself well, you or can't, take me out of the play you sure can't, you can't have a double minor to be on the ice you can't yeah. have a double minor or a major for submarine and sammy sallow and you're scoring you got 81 points on the year and you're the you're you're needed to win this game like he's he he's like maybe he's realized how important he is to the team yeah, just too much of a disadvantage to lose cleaned him. up I'd like to, you know, I don't want to say he's cleaned up 80% of that stuff because it's still the slew foot stuff is cheap. Like that's, that a, stuff greasy, is, that's, that's a greasy, that's a greasy right? thing. But hopefully we don't see too much of that, that well, I mean, crazy stuff. I mean, hockey is a game, is, is a tough game and it's a game of intimidation. If you can throw somebody out their game by knocking them out, knock, rubbing them on the, on the boards or doing something, you got to do it. By any means necessary. And, he's, and, and he does way. it. Yeah. yeah. Walking that tightrope right, right on the line. But, I mean, that's that, where you want to live. That's a, I mean, yeah. I mean, like Brandon Shanahan, we love him. He did some horrible things. Yeah. Yeah, and let's face it. Sometimes the Department of Player Safety falls asleep for months of the season. <laughs> yeah, they woke up. They woke up last week to, to hand out yeah. two suspensions. Yeah, but at other times this year, they, they go on. They on go on holiday. They they suspended a Maple Leaf player about five months too late. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, so that'll wrap it up for this week's podcast. Make sure you follow us on Twitter at Pucksnet Sierra Pucksnet Ka Ka and, Ka. and uh, subscribe on iTunes. Rate in. Uh, uh, Rate and reviews on iTunes. Leave a comment. That means the world does. You guys are sticking around for five minutes. We're paying. If you don't know what that is, I'll, I'll explain to you through the show. Uh, yeah, iTunes. Uh, like us, our Facebook page. Uh, follow us on Instagram. All that jazz. Uh, Want to support the show. Besides uh, subscriptions or uh, positive reviews on iTunes, tell a friend. Word of mouth is the best. But if you want to throw a couple dollars, shake a couple shekels our way, head on over to patreon.com slash pucks on net. There you get a lot, a fair bit of bonus content um, every week. After our regular episodes, we do five minutes for paying. We do a monthly uh, a special episode. Uh, you see our show notes. I'll post them uh, right before I post this episode to see how off track we did get or how many things we didn't talk about. And we, uh, Paul and I are doing some music episodes. So if you want to support the show, help help cover some production costs, head over to patreon.com slash pucks on net. And if you are a backer, 
you head on over there right now for five minutes for paying, which starts right now. <laughs>